There's an axiom, a word of knowledge that we implicitly at least go by here at our church. I don't think it will come as much as a surprise to you who are part of our church family. It goes like this, hard preaching makes soft hearts, soft preaching makes hard hearts. Hard preaching makes soft hearts, but soft preaching makes hard hearts. And we come to church implicitly knowing that. We kind of expect our toes to be stepped on. And if our toes aren't stepped on, we leave with a sense of maybe we didn't really hear what we needed to hear. And I believe that. I think I practice that. But the surprising thing about our text this morning is the tenor of the text and the approach of the text of the Apostle Paul, who was no stranger to stepping on toes. The Apostle Paul in our text this morning gives us words that are drenched in mercy and drenched in love and drenched in concern. Because as he was writing to a church many, many years ago in another place, another culture, that church, we run the risk of making those same mistakes and what he says in our text today is that that church was impoverishing themselves. That, that church, the members of the church were impoverishing themselves. They had such resources and such a ground of joy available to them. And instead, they were living by a different standard. And they were sacrificing the significance and the joy and the hope and the fulfillment to use a contemporary cliche, the flourishing that God intends His children to have. And so what I'm suggesting today is the text, it was surprising to me, and I hope it will be surprising and encouraging to you. And maybe along the way, we'll still step on a few toes, but overall, you should leave with a heart of encouragement today, challenged that there is great joy in upside-down living. We can find great joy in what the world would consider upside-down living. The context in these first chapters of 1 Corinthians, if you'd open your Bibles there to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the context here, as most of you know, is there is this concern about the, the systemic great reversal about reality, that there is one way of looking at the world that the world system says is wise, but God looks at it and says that's folly. And when God reveals what he considers to be meaningful in reality, what he considers to be wisdom, the world system will look at that and say, that's foolishness. And this tension, this reversal, this, this upside-downness of looking at reality, it is part and parcel of all of life. And it's at the root of a lot of the discussions that we hear today for those of us that strive to be faithful Christians, for those of us that strive to be Bible Christians, this idea that we will end up on the wrong side of history. And we hear that often because of what we believe about one matter or another in the culture that we're on the wrong side of history. And of course, the question that we really have to get down to is, do we want to be on God's side of history? And that's God's wisdom versus the folly of the world. And that's at play in these chapters in this New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians as Paul writes to this ancient church. And what we're going to find today is we're going to find out a little more of what this looks like in real life. Because if we are to find this joy, this joy in upside down living, this joy in God's design for us, we have to know and we have to recognize and we have to remember all that he's done for us and all that he's doing. And so at the end of the day, the question this morning is by what standard will we live life? How will we evaluate reality? How, how will we find what we would call a consistent worldview, which really is just to say, how will we live Christianly? How will we live for Jesus, to say it in an old-fashioned way? The Bible tells us back in chapter 2, the last verse of the chapter, that we have the mind of Christ. What does that look like? Well, Paul gives us some details today. And it influences our decisions and our choices. It influences our commitments. And a challenge for me this week, and I think for you perhaps as well, it also even influences our emotions. I don't know if any of you have trouble controlling your emotions. 
But the implication of this text is that even the way we feel can be influenced by what we believe to be ultimately true and whether we're chasing after God's wisdom or the folly of this world. So with all that as background, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up in verse 16 this morning. These were a couple of verses that we dealt with last week, but we'll begin there and we'll read down into chapter 4 this morning. And as I read, I remind you as I do every Lord's Day, this is God's word for us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Please follow along. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is how we should regard us. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Here in these verses, the Apostle Paul challenges the Corinthians long ago, and the Word of God challenges us today to consider by what standard we're living our lives. And he does so by addressing some very key questions. And I'll divide the text this morning by looking at those questions. The first one is this, who are we? After all, fundamentally, who are we? And according to verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3, we have this new identity. It's a radical identity. We are the dwelling place of God. We are the dwelling place of God. The behavior of the Corinthians showed that they'd forgotten this basic reality of who they were. They were holding, embracing a flawed view of themselves, and that view of themselves was grounded in this culture, in this world. It was temporal. It was this world-centered as opposed to eternally centered. And what they had forgotten, it gets more specific than that. It's not enough just to say we need to remember we're God's people. Paul says, no, no, as the church, you're the place where the Spirit dwells in the world. The church is the dwelling of the Spirit of God, it says. Do you see it again? Look in 16 of chapter 3. Do you not know, this is a reminder, it's a gentle chiding of the readers. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Now, lest anyone misunderstand, perhaps you're new to this kind of preaching, he is not in any way talking about a church building. He's not talking about the structure of a church building Church buildings didn't even exist from what we can tell historically until about the third century. The church is defined as the people of God, the gathering of God's people. And without a doubt, there's a, there's a universal application of understanding all believers, but those believers are represented in real flesh and blood gatherings, just like the one this morning. We are the church in this place, at this time. And what the Bible tells us is that God is pleased in His Spirit to dwell in us. That's who we are as an identity. We are the dwelling place of God. So much so that in verse 17, God will bring judgment on anyone who seeks to destroy a church. 
because God's temple is holy and we are that temple. Now, let me tell you what this implies, first of all. This implies that there's some sense, I know it's a mystery, and a mystery in the sense that we don't understand all of the details, but there is some sense in which the presence of God is uniquely engaged in a flawed gathering of regular people, flesh and blood, just like us. Let me say it a little more precisely, or attempt to at least, that there is a way in which God, who is omnipresent, you recognize that, the definition of God is, he is there's no place where his presence is not, but in some unique relational and I would suggest significant and powerful way, God's Spirit chooses to work and dwell and relationally be present among a gathering like ours in a way that it is not present anywhere else. It's surely not present in Sacramento or Washington. It's surely not present where entertainment comes from. It's it's surely not present in educational institutions. And let me press in a little bit. In the way that it's in the church, it's not even present in seminaries. It's not present in parachurch organizations. Now, I believe that God is pleased to work in faithful seminaries and faithful parachurch organizations. We support missionaries who are part of a parachurch organization. But this text says that in the gathering of God's people, just like 1 Corinthians, where the people came together in the city of Corinth, God's Spirit uniquely dwells in that kind of gathering. So God is pleased to do something in your life and my life that He will not do apart from the gathering of that's just like this. That's stunning. That's a place of privilege. Just by way of practical application, that should remind you that whatever you might do financially in supporting other ministries, other ministries that are great and appropriate and good to support, your commitment needs to be to a local gathering of God's people. Your primary commitment should be there. Because This text says this is what God's Spirit is pleased to dwell in. He's pleased to dwell in the church. And that's stunning. The second aspect that this uh, truth that this implies, this truth that God's dwelling is in the church, the church is a temple. It's the phrase that's used, a sanctuary. And I would remind you what I've taught you before, but I want to emphasize again this morning. The purpose of a temple was to put the glory of a God on display. If you'd go to an ancient city and you wanted to know about their God, what would you do? You'd say, show me your temple. And they'd go look at the temple, and that temple was some kind of representation of their God and their God's glory. Well, God is pleased to make gatherings like this His temple. So for the entire outside world, if they want to see God's glory... They come to a group like Calvary Baptist of Santa Barbara. And I know what you're thinking. It's what I'm thinking. It's like, it seems like God could have done better to show his glory than a group like us, right? But this is the the tension. It's the paradox that what appears to be folly to the world is for God great wisdom. And that's the reason that the church matters. It's that as we live together as the church, we have the opportunity to be the dwelling place of God's Spirit and the place in which God is pleased to show His glory to anyone whom He moves to come find that glory. And of course, you recognize the irony of this. We're talking about upside down, the wisdom of the world versus God's wisdom. The irony of this is that This kind of gathering right here this morning is considered foolish and folly to the world. But in God's wisdom, God would say to anyone, you want to know where my spirit dwells? My spirit dwells in a congregation just like this. God's wisdom is folly to the world. This demands a couple of things if we recognize that our church Our community here is the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. It demands, first of all, that we be reminded of this. Because we are forgetful people. 
This is a spiritual truth that is not immediately evident when we just look at one another. If we look at one another this morning, sometimes we look past the glory of God. Don't say amen, but it's true. And so we need to be reminded. And there's a sense in which that's what every Sunday morning is. And there's a specific sense in which when we come to the table, which we happen to do here on the first Sunday of the month, that's the purpose of the table, is to be reminded that this is the place where God's Spirit dwells. We together are the dwelling place of God's Spirit, even so much so that we eat a meal together, quote unquote. We take bread, we drink the cup. It's to remind us, to, to reset, to kind of start all over again, and to renew our minds that we are the temple, the dwelling place of God. The second thing it demands is a sense of commitment. We need to be committed. And I know it's, been a, it's become a cliche that you hear it out of my mouth that we're a flawed church and we have hurt one another and churches have hurt people and pe- churches have failed in significant ways. There are frustrations, there are inconveniences, there are shortcomings in the church. But listen carefully. Nowhere in the New Testament is there any, any conception of a believer who is a follower of Jesus who is unchurched. The idea that because the church has hurt you, you're just going to find God in nature. You're going to find God in community somewhere else. You're going to find God in doing good works in the neighborhood. That idea is foreign to the New Testament. Because the necessity of yielding to one another and bearing with one another and forgiving one another, even one another that likes a different kind of music than you like or who dresses differently or, God forbid, has a different political position than you do, that is where God's glory shows up. We should be committed to our church. And it would be inappropriate if I don't also mention that this demands a sense of a passion for holiness. It's not just that we get together and we say, yeah, we're a bunch of flawed people, but God is pleased to dwell here. No, the text says that the temple is holy and you are holy because you are God's temple. And the principle there is that our position of holiness should be lived out in holiness. And so the whole thing of, well, nobody's perfect, so we're just going to coast, that doesn't work for the people of God. We are driven to holiness together. Who are we? We are a radical new identity. We are the dwelling place of God. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, what standard governs our commitment to this or to whatever local church we're a part of? What standard governs our commitment? Is it convenience? Is it just mere duty? Or is it this God-drenched wisdom that this is what God is pleased to do in the world? And he wants us to be part of it. He has designed it so that this is his dwelling place. Is that our standard? When we come to understand this church or whatever church we might be a part of. A radical identity. The dwelling place of God. There's also this sense of how are we unique Paul reveals that, not just and beyond, on top of and beyond our identity, there's this sense of uniqueness, and this is a a radical distinction. We live by, we've used this phrase before, we live by true truth. We live by truth that is true. And as we've already seen, this, this circles back to Paul's fundamental assertions in this first part of 1 Corinthians. There's the critical nature of truth that is true. Look back, I hope your Bibles are still open. Look back, for example, in chapter 1. Look at verse 18 for just a moment. Remember what he said? He said, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Look down at verse 23 of chapter number 1. In verse 22, it says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Look in chapter 2, look at verses 
3 and through 5, he's talking about the way he came to the Corinthians and he came in weakness. He didn't come in anything that was impressive. And what does he say? He says in verse 4 at the end of the verse, but I, I came in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Do you see what he's setting up? He has set up this radical distinction of philosophy and of approach to life. You can either live according to the wisdom of the world, which is essentially, to use an old-time word, worldliness, or you can chase after the wisdom of God. And those are your only two choices. Let me say that again. Those are your only two choices. There's this uniqueness that is the truth of a radical distinction that we live by true truth. And so you've got this inversion, this paradox, these two polar opposites, these two quote-unquote wisdoms, and really only one is wise, only one is true truth. So look at how he unpacks this. Uh, lay your eyes again on verse 18, and let's walk through it together. Notice what he says in verse 18. He says, let no one deceive himself. Uh, I've thought a lot this week about when I was in student ministry. One of the things I used to often tell students is, it's one thing to be deceived by the world. It's another thing to be deceived by, by the evil one, by, by the forces, by demonic forces. But what a foolish thing it is to deceive yourself. What a foolish thing that is. And look at what Paul says. He says, let no one deceive himself. The implication is the truth is available, but you've chosen to ignore it or deny it or choose something else. Let no one deceive himself, verse 18. If any among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. Clearly, the idea is truly wise. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is folly with God. And then he gives evidence of that from the Bible, from the Word of God. In the middle of verse 19, for it is written. So there he goes to what you and I would call the Old Testament. He catches the wise in their craftiness. By the way, this is all the way through what we call the Old Testament. The idea of setting a trap, but the one who sets the trap gets caught in the trap, right? And there's a classic story in the Old Testament about this. You remember the story of Esther and Haman, who was going to kill all of the Jews? And I don't have time to go through the whole story. It's an incredible story of God's providence, that God works in ways that are unseen. But to give, you, give away the end of the story... Haman ends up getting hanged on the very gallows that he built to kill Jews on. Because you see, that's what God does. God catches the wise, quote unquote, we would say, in their craftiness. In verse 20, and again, so here's another reference from the Bible, the Old Testament scriptures. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. And the word futile there is the idea of vanity like in Ecclesiastes. The wisdom of the world comes to nothing. And Paul's already told us this in 1 Corinthians because the rulers of this world, they thought they were doing the wise thing in crucifying Jesus. They thought they were clever. And what happened? They brought about through that their own demise and the plan of redemption. You see? Apparent wisdom becomes foolishness. So the conclusion is in verse 21, the first part of the verse, where Paul says, look at it again, so let no one boast in men. And you see, this was the problem. Because they were forgetting all that God had done for them, because they were forgetting all that God has for them, they were being petty, and they were being divisive, and they were choosing up sides, and they were quarreling with one another. And this shows that they were boasting in men, not boasting in God. To boast is the idea of what you, what you value, what you treasure, what, what, what will you esteem as something willing to place your identity with, to identify with, and to boast about? You shouldn't boast in men, because according to the context, that's boasting in folly. And at its core, this world system and our own sinfulness leads to an upside-down reality. If we chase after this world system, if, if we yield our own sinfulness we end up looking at life in a way that we think and by the world is affirmed as being true, but we're literally living upside down. And so therefore, we're called in the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 9. Remember what God says there? Thus says the Lord, 
Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. For I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. All of this shows why compared to your neighbor, perhaps compared to your family, there's a sense that we're living in two different realities. You know this, people at work, like their perception of life and what's real and what's meaningful and what's valuable and what they would quote boast in is just completely upside down. Some of you students who are in education right now, you recognize this in the classroom with students or perhaps even professors who have what they consider to be ultimate, have ultimate value is completely upside down from the way you choose to live. But you see, this is not anything new because in the fallen world that we live in, the people of God will always have a different value system. They will live upside down compared to the world around us because as one author said, there are different yardsticks here. The the numbers don't line up the way we evaluate what the world calls freedom, we would call bondage, what the world calls dignity, we would call shame, what the world thinks is important because it's meaningful, we say is temporal, not eternal. Again, what the world calls wisdom, we say that's folly. There's a radical distinction because we live by true truth. So let me ask you this morning. What standard governs your understanding and your embrace of ultimate truth? This is not new to us. A couple of years ago, we worked through the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, our title for that series was Countercultural. Because the way Jesus said to live is upside down from the world system. This is What we find in the Beatitudes, we find it in the Sermon on the Mount. What the world considers righteous is often unrighteous. What the world considers strength is really weakness. And what God considers weakness, we consider strength. What the world considers weakness, we consider strength. Wisdom versus folly. Now, the meat of the text is the next passage. Because what happens is, this upside down, two ways to live contrast, it's especially seen in what we have in Christ. That that we live by God's standard. And in living by God's standard, what's unveiled is the far greater treasure than we typically know and understand. Uh, let, Let me make sure that you get this. I'm afraid I'm not connecting. What is revealed in the next few verses is the incredible richness that we barter away if we live in worldly wisdom instead of God's wisdom. And what Paul is crying for the Corinthians to catch and what the Word of God would want us to understand, the Holy Spirit would want us to grasp from this text, is that if we choose to ignore the wisdom of God, we are giving away our birthright that is an incredible inheritance of richness and joy and a place of comfort. There's an ultimate treasure here. Because look at what he says in verse 21. For all things are yours. Yes, yes, you're in a world where where the culture considers what we believe to be foolish and where sometimes even what we believe and what we practice will cause us to be marginalized. It's possible you might not get a job that you want. It's possible that your family might marginalize you. But all things are yours, Paul says, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, because those were the petty issues they were arguing about. Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. But then he goes to the biggest issues. Look at it in verse 22. Or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Listen carefully. What do we have? This is radical assurance. It's radical assurance that all is yours, and we are Christ's. All is ours, and we are Christ's. And again, that's the Beatitudes. The Beatitude talks about blessed are the the gentle or the meek, 
Because they will do what? They will inherit the earth. Worldly wisdom, that's folly. In God's system, this is what he please, is pleased to do. Those who are gentle and who recognize their need, who take their strength that he gives and, he, and, and keep it under control because they're living in God's kingdom. God says everything is theirs. The world is theirs. The Beatitudes begin and end with promises of the kingdom of heaven. Everything is ours. And there's great assurance here. There's great freedom. There's great hope. Because all is ours and we are Christ's. It's all ours and ultimately one day it will all be ours. Revelation taught us that, right? And it's all toward and for His glory. And so the mystery here is that all things are caught up in God's great purposes for His own. And this is Paul's way to the Corinthians of saying what he said later to the Romans. We all know this text where he says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Listen, when we live by worldly standards, by any worldly standard, you know what we're doing? We're trading away diamonds for peanuts. We're trading away diamonds for peanuts. I've told you perhaps this story before. I avoid it because I know it's a stumbling block for some of you because it's about the Astros. But many years ago, many years ago in Houston, someone gave me four tickets to club level seats. And they gave them to me on a Sunday morning. And my wife was away, because she would be all over those tickets, but she was away. And strangely, I know it's hard to believe, but I couldn't find anyone to go to the game with me. These were prime tickets. And literally, I went by myself. She was out of town. I went by myself. Couldn't get anybody to go with me. And there's a level of frustration about that. I kept looking at the tickets. I, I got to my seat. They were great seats in uh, foul ball territory, you know, and I'm looking at the tickets and I'm thinking how great this is. And while I'm looking at the tickets and the game is just starting, somebody hits a foul ball and I recognize it's coming straight to me. Now, my athleticism is reasonably limited. Let me just be honest about that. <laughs> But it wasn't like a line drive foul ball, you know, it was a lob foul ball and I, I had these tickets that I was holding in my hand and instead of dropping the tickets and catching the ball, I tried to catch it with one hand and that didn't go well for me. It was great for the kid that was sitting in front of me, but it didn't go well for me. But I, I always, when I think of this thing of trading away diamonds for peanuts, I think of, of those tickets by the time I was holding them there and that foul ball was coming, the tickets were worthless. The foul ball would have been great, but I was hanging on to something that was worthless, and I missed something that, at least relatively speaking, was better. And don't you see that's what we do? When we adapt a worldly, this world philosophy, this culture around us, when we adapt that as the ultimate good, what this text says, Paul says, in a sense he's saying to the Corinthians, what are you doing? What? Everything's yours. You've got everything. And instead, you're arguing about who's your favorite teacher and what we're going to find out, that was just the beginning of all of their problems, as we'll see as we work through 1 Corinthians. They were separated at the Lord's table. There were sexual sin issues. They, they, they were proud about the way they practiced charismatic gifts. There were all these strange things going on. And it's as though Paul is saying... You're evaluating things by a foolish yardstick. And in doing so, you're taking diamonds and you're trading them away for a bag of peanuts. So do you see my point this morning? That there's joy in upside down living. And we trade away that joy. Like Esau's foolishness of trading away his birthright for a pot of soup. All is ours. And we are Christ's. And you recognize that this passage is great for biblical counsel? Are you discouraged? This text tells you that everything is yours. Are you fearful? This text says everything is yours. 
Are you embittered about being wronged? This text says everything is yours. And the question you have to ask is, will you walk by sight or will you walk by faith? Because I will grant to you that at any particular time, you could look at your circumstances and you could miss it. But when you do that, when you evaluate your circumstances, when you evaluate ultimate reality just by your circumstances, you're taking diamonds and you're trading them away for peanuts. And what Paul says to the Corinthians, and he says it to us living in Santa Barbara in the 21st century, is in the gospel, because of the cross of Christ, everything is yours. This is not some kind of weird health, wealth, prosperity gospel. You get that. This is a way to deal with our losses. It's a way to understand our heartaches. It's a way to appropriate and appreciate our blessings because God is pleased in His economy, in His plan, in His way to bless us with all things. So all of life should be viewed through a a gospel lens, through a Bible lens, through godly wisdom lenses. All of life, this is our standard. And so let me ask you this morning, what standard influences your emotions? You you know the way to answer that question is ask yourself what makes you most quickly angry? What gives you an immediate sense of despair? Where do frustrations rise up so quickly? Because that's an indication of the standard you're using in managing your understanding of ultimate truth because that gets fleshed out in your emotions. What standard influences your emotions as you consider all that you have and all that you need? And perhaps this is a great place to stop and remind you that this incredible provision for not just now but for eternity It's only for those who have their sins forgiven. If you're watching today or if you're with us in this room and there's never been a time in your life when you've humbled yourself and acknowledged your guilt and your sin and put your hope and faith in Jesus Christ, these promises, this incredible joy, this assurance, the kind of of certain living that Paul talks about, it's only available for those that know their sins are forgiven. And worse than that, What you do face is the holy and righteous judgment of God over your sin. There's no reason to wait. There's no reason to put this off. If you've never in a real way put your hope and faith in Jesus, the time to do that is today. That Jesus came and he gave his life to pay the penalty for your sins, and he offers you, to your credit, his own righteousness. This is what we call the gospel, and it is the greatest possession that you could ever imagine. Don't give it away. And for those of us that have yielded to the gospel, don't live as though we think peanuts are more valuable than diamonds. The last text as we pick up chapter 4, it's really the question of how then do we live? And what we find is that there's a radical freedom that we can live in because we live for the approval of only one. Now, by way of application, what Paul does here is he talks very specifically about the leaders in the church. But there's an application to all of our lives. But to the Corinthians, he's saying, listen, the way you're thinking about those of us who are leaders, it's all upside down, and you need to have a godly wisdom perspective on this. In your dysfunction and in your disobedience, he's trying to the Corinthian church, he's trying to say, fix this. And an example of it is how you regard us. And so he returns to talk about specifically the circumstance that was going on in the Corinthian church. But there's an application for all of us. Let me try to show you that. Pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ. And many of you have heard before, servants there is not the typical word for servant that ended up being translated deacon, but it's a word for an under rower. This is Ben-Hur, right? When Ben-Hur is a slave and he's chained to the oars, you know, this is the, although that was a, a more delightful, if you can imagine, 
presentation of what under rowers really dealt with. They were down on the bottom of the ship, and as they would row, they were slaves. They were chained to the oars. And Paul says, that's who we are. We're just servants. You all are exalting us, Apollos and Paul and Cephas. You all are exalting us because you bought into worldly wisdom. But God's wisdom is, we're just under rowers. And then he uses another metaphor, and stewards, the idea is a household steward, stewards of the mysteries of God. Household managers were almost always slaves. Think, if you know your Old Testament, think Joseph here. This is Joseph who was put in authority over the household, and even in the prison he was put in authority. This, he was still a slave, he was still a prisoner, and yet he labored and had authority. This is the, the idea of being a steward. So, by the way, there's tension there, right? I mean, he's just said, think about what he's just said in chapter 3. By the way, Paul didn't write chapter 3 and then chapter 4. Those were all added for our use centuries later. So he's writing and he just says, everything is yours. Oh, and by the way, I'm a slave. There's a tension there that you just have to live in. That you're not your own, and yet God gives you everything. You have everything in Christ, and Christ is God. You have everything, but at the very same time, you're not your own. You're an under rower. You are a household servant, even if you're a manager. And of course, there are principles there. With Paul as an apostle, he had responsibilities, but at the very same time, he was a slave. At the very same time. Look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found successful. Right? Now look at it. That they be found faithful, dependable, with integrity. That they be found reliable. The same word that's used of God in chapter 1, verse 9. That God is faithful. And so preachers and leaders, that's the specific application. We are not creators. We are not initiators. We are not originators. We are entrusted with the message. And there's a great dignity in all of this. Paul says, stop thinking in worldly ways about your pastors, about your leaders. And he goes on, verse 3, and this sounds strange to us. Uh, Perhaps as you read it, you might think it sounds arrogant. It is not that. Paul says in verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. Why is that? Because temporal evaluations by other people are notoriously superficial or biased or unfair. Paul says, I'm not going to trust either people that say I don't have any qualification for the ministry, or I'm not going to trust people who tell me I'm the greatest pastor since whoever. Because all of that is unreliable. In the middle of verse 3, he says, in fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. Why? Because sometimes we're too harsh on ourselves, or sometimes we're too easy on ourselves. And Paul says, I can't really trust my own judgment. Well, then what's the point? At the end of verse 4 is the point. It is the Lord who judges me. And there's great freedom in that. If you live this way, If you're a pastor, if you're an elder, it's like we're not laboring for the approval of the people. We're not laboring for approval of the west side here. We're not laboring for approval of the other pastors that are in this area. We've got one approval we're looking for. There's only one well done that we should be concerned about. We're living for the approval of only one. And don't you see this applies to all of us? The same judgment, the the judgment of the worker getting his wages in chapter 3, verse 8. The same judgment of being tested by fire in verses 13 and 15 of chapter 3. The same judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Not only will your pastors be there, but you will be there as well. And the question is, who have you lived for? Whom have you lived for? Whose approval did you seek after? Sometimes we can seek after one another's approval in the church. That's problematic in and of itself. But how foolish it is to think that as people of God, we will receive the affirmation of the world. And yet you see this everywhere. You especially see it, by the way, and here's just, this is a warning place where this is not in my notes, so I'm just diving off of a bridge here, all right? But you especially see it in academia today. You see in academia where the primary concern is, am I going to get the approval of others, either my professors or if you're a professor, of others that are in the intellectual academic world? 
And it causes, almost inevitably, it causes a sense of compromise. All of us need to be careful. Our eyes should be tuned toward hearing only one well done. And that is the well done of our Savior. Well, let me hurry on. This is not to say that there are not places for making distinctions and making judgments. A couple of weeks, we're going to land in chapter 5, and Paul basically chides the church for not making a judgment when they should have. So there are judgments that will come. But look at what he says in verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness. By the way, that's not so much sinful things as it is the things that are unseen. This is back in chapter 2. Remember what he said? No one can really know what's in the heart of a man but the man himself. That's what's hidden here. That's what's in darkness. And Paul says, I don't even trust my own evaluation. But God will reveal it. And also will disclose the purposes, the ideas, the motives of the heart. Then each one will receive. Now let me stop here because this circles back to my enthusiasm for this text. When I think about preaching, when I think about my own sin, my own inadequacies, I think about the judgment seat of Christ, and this is what Paul is talking about. There will come a time when we will finally be evaluated by the only one that matters. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking instinctively, instinctively as I was preparing for the sermon. But as you read this, I, th I think a lot of us are in the same boat. You read this, and you're reading, and you instinctively are thinking, this is what it's going to say. Then each one will receive his rebuke. But it doesn't say that. Do you see that? Because I'll deserve plenty of rebuke. But it says each one will receive commendation. Each one will receive his praise. That's how merciful your God is. That's how we stand in grace. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And that that gives us freedom. No, we're not perfect and we're not going to be until that day. But when we seek to live according to the wisdom of God as opposed to the wisdom of the world, there's rich freedom when we understand that all is ours in Christ and we are Christ's. So there's assurance there and then there's freedom that we only are living for His approval. I ask you today, what standard informs and empowers your service to Christ through his local body. For whose approval are you laboring? For whose approval? Whose approval do you live for? All this boils down to the wisdom of God versus worldly wisdom. And all of that, according to 1 Corinthians, boils down to Jesus and his cross. It's all centered on Jesus. And the truth is we can drift from this and we can deceive ourselves. That's the reason Paul says don't let anyone deceive himself. We can embrace the philosophies of the world around us. It's a, a constant temptation. Therefore, we have to daily have our minds renewed. But the question when it comes to Jesus is this question that my friend Pastor Besner suggests. He says, do we find Jesus glorious or merely useful? Do we find Jesus glorious or merely useful? Are we so pragmatic that we miss the wonder of the joy and the provision and the glory that God gives us in the gospel? I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to find joy in upside down living. I want you to know that we have this radical new identity. God dwells in us. We have this distinction that we live in, that we live by true truth, that we have this assurance that all is ours and we are Christ's. And I want us to live in freedom. We live for the approval of only one. Your takeaway today, by whose standard will you live? By whose standard will you live? Father, speak to our hearts according to your word. Where I have failed to be clear, or far worse, where I've failed to be accurate, 
clarify or correct in the hearts and minds of my hearers today. Father, do your work through your spirit in all of our hearts because we, we are all, in a sense, we are all Corinthians, lured away by the wisdom of this world, which is eternally folly. Help us see that there is really one treasure. There's really one ground upon which to live. There's really one hope. There's really one defining truth for the mundane issues of our lives and the great crises that sometimes we face in lives. And the simplistic yet the simple and clear answer to all of these is it's always Jesus. Jesus and his cross. Remind us of our greatest treasure today. In his name we pray, amen.